Steen! Steen! Hi, everybody! Steen, everybody! All right. I'm sort of the pinch hitter tonight. I'm awake. We'll see how this goes. We believe in you. I believe in you too. <laughs> Hauntings at Haskell House, a tale of SF history. By me. Now there's an, folks say, there's an angry and frustrated poltergeist that still haunts this house out on Fort Mason. The story goes like this. It was the duel to end all duels in California, the death to slavery in our golden state. On the second floor, to the idea of slavery in our golden state, on the second floor of, oh no. Did I eat a slide? I'm gonna work with this version. Oh. <laughs> on the second floor of the Haskell House, looking out over the bay, Senator David C. Broderick spent the last three days of his life with a bullet in his chest. To understand how he ended up here, we have to understand the complicated man he was. Growing up in New York, David C. Broderick worked as a saloon keeper and Tammany henchman, which for the uninitiated is more of a um, gangster for politics in New York City. But he was a voracious reader. He read everything, history and literature, art, science, Hi. and sometimes ships. We're all punchy, yay. <laughs> but the thing he loved to read about most in the world, the thing that brought him greatness and demise, the law. In 1849, <laughs> in 1849, he left New York for San Francisco. Already a young, ambitious politician, he had one goal in mind, become US Senator of California. In two years, he became president of the state senate and lieutenant governor. In three, almost made senator. In four, leader of the Democratic Party. In five, complete control of the California state government. Broderick was headstrong, powerful, and ambitious, maybe to a fault. He tried to push the election a whole year earlier because he knew he'd win. That plan didn't work out. It broke the Democratic Party. He lost all the power he worked for. What followed were years of bribery, accusa bribery accusations, election fraud, and an investigation by the Vigilance Committee. He eventually did become senator, but not without the stench of corruption wafting all around him. Uh, waft, waft, waft. <laughs> and that also created turmoil in the Democratic Party. <laughs> now enter California Supreme Court Justice David S. Terry. Judge Terry was a Southern Democrat with sympathies towards slavery. He was a bit of a roughie and he spent time in jail for shanking a guy in the neck. <laughs> and he had also been on the Vigilance Committee. Now Broderick, also a, a man with a rough past, uh, had been done in by the same Vigilance Committee but he was a new kind of Democrat, one that was staunchly against slavery. California was still trying to figure out what it wanted to do with this whole slavery idea. But Broderick was staunchly a free soil man. Free soil was a party short-lived in the mid-1800s that was staunchly against the expansion of the institution of slavery into the West. Um, now, Early one morning in 1859, Broderick was having breakfast with some fancy friends in a fancy hotel restaurant. And he's reading his fancy, fancy newspaper. And there he's reading about accounts of a speech that Terry made. And in this speech, Terry was uh, doing what you might call talking smack about Broderick and his free soilness. He even took a swipe at Frederick Douglass himself. This upset Broderick to no end. And he was quite vocal about his feelings inside the hotel restaurant. And these words just carried over the entire place wafted everywhere. 
Gossip about Broderick's words got to Terry. Terry demanded an apology. Broderick refused. Terry resigned his office, sent a letter back to Broderick demanding the satisfaction of men, a duel. Broderick, not one to back down from a fight, accepted. Broderick spent the, last, spent the night before the duel in the home of his friend Leonidas Haskell, who would eventually be a major for General Fremont in the Civil War. He didn't sleep. He didn't eat. He just laid on the floor drinking coffee all night long, gibbering to himself. <laughs> if you are into such things, this is what parapsychologists might call emotional imprinting of the house. Science. <laughs> you all failed me. You all failed me. <laughs> the duel was to take place at the edge of Lake Merced. A crowd had gathered, weapons chosen, positions set, but then the sheriff showed up and stopped the whole thing. Because you see, dueling was now illegal in California. <laughs> no, he did not shoot the sheriff. But secret plans were made to meet again the next day. Another 24 hours of Broderick living in complete fear and anguish. See how I did that? See how I did that? You like how I did that? On September 13th, they met again very early in the morning on a private farmer's property with only a few friends around. Terry was cool. Broderick, a saggy-eyed mess. Terry won his choice of weapons, his own pistols. Eight-inch barrels with Derringer-sized balls. The gunsmith loading the guns protested, saying Broderick's gun had way too easy of a hair trigger. Broderick just kind of waved it off. Terry didn't stop it. Both men were searched for extra weapons. Broderick second going over to Terry, patting him down. Terry second going over to Broderick, roughly patting him down. They walked the 20 paces, turned around facing sideways. In case you don't know, you, you try and face sideways in a duel, so that way, ideally, you both have a slimmer target. <laughs> ideally. The count is given. Fire. One, two. <laughs> Broderick's gun went off, sending the bullet <laughs> just at Terry's feet. Terry slowly lifts up his gun, aims. <laughs> straight into Broderick's chest. Broderick flew backwards, crumple, bleeding on the ground. All of Terry's friends quickly whisked him away because he knew this was not going to look good. <laughs> Haskell grabs Broderick, throws him into the wagon, sends him off back to his house. Now, let's really think about this, okay? There's no Uber. You don't have your little cute little compact car. There's no little bike lane. You are in a wooden wagon on a dirty road from Lake Merced, the part that none of you have ever been to before, right? all the way to Fort Mason with a bullet in his chest. For three days, Broderick lay there bleeding out in bed. The bullet lodged so deep, doctors couldn't get to it. He jolted and convulsed, occasionally saying something in between attacks of pain. At midnight on the third day, he said his last words, they have killed me because I oppose the extension of slavery and fell unconscious. After a few hours, at 9.20 a.m. on September 16th, 1857, David Colbreth Broderick died. San Francisco blew up. People gathered to try and lynch Terry. Terry actually got away and was acquitted because he's an asshole. Broderick was actually turned into a martyr, like a war hero. His death not only changed the hearts of Californians about the illegal custom of dueling, but when, uh, the, civil, when, uh, when the Civil War started, California joined the Union Army as a free state. <laughs> Sidebar, white guy had to die for that to happen. Truth, truth. Thank you, thank you. 
In 1863, the Union Army took over the Haskell House and the surrounding area and uh, eventually turned it into what we now know as Fort Mason. And ever since then, many captains and colonels who've lived there have all reported strange happenings inside the old Haskell House. Captain James Linus' family reported seeing bodiless shadows moving throughout all the rooms in the house. Colonel Cecil Puckett, Puckett <laughs> said he always felt like he was being followed. He said, I feel like someone or something is following me about the house, even watches me as I take a shower. <laughs> when Captain Everett, uh, Captain Everett Jones moved in, his family didn't believe in ghosts. Uh, in fact, they, they'd all joke about it all the time. The family would throw a big old party and everybody would be like, oh, the ghost, the ghost. Over and over and over again. Whole night. Next morning, huge crash in the kitchen. They ran to see what had happened. One of the picture frames had somehow been pulled out and thrown on the floor by no one. The frame still had the hook in it, along with the one and a half inch nail that was still attached. The hole was perfectly intact in the wall. The family said it wasn't like somebody had yanked it. It was as if somebody had pushed it out from the inside. They didn't stop making jokes, and for the next six months, weird things happening all over the house. Pictures flying off walls, light fixtures bolted to the ceiling would fall from the ceiling, one time nearly hitting the, daughter, the captain's daughter by inches. At that point, they stopped joking. This poltergeist activity, if that's something you're into, never stopped. Lights flickering, toilets flushing, plants tipping over. A painter working on the house reported being pushed off the roof one day by no one. Psychics, science, have reported seeing the presence of a man in a long black coat and top hat pacing back and forth in the house. Uh, is it David C. Broderick still, in, still living out his last days of fear and anguish, taking revenge on anybody who mocks him? Oh, and psychics have also said they felt the presence of many people, other people, hiding in the house. You see, what most even native Californians don't realize is that just a few paces up from the Haskell House in Fort Mason is Black Point. And Black Point, before it was Fort Mason, many fancy San Francisco elite lived there. And that was actually the last stop at the western end of the Underground Railroad. I had more slides here, but I don't have them. So if you're case you're wondering, Broderick Street is actually named after David C. Broderick. Um, and if you head on down to Lake Merced, the part that you never go to, <laughs> you'll eventually find this sign pointing you towards a park. Go into that park, and inside that park you'll find this little marker. And that little marker has little arrows pointing you to the very back grove where you will see those two markers. <laughs> it's exactly where they stood, Broderick and Terry. So, let us all raise a glass to David C. Broderick and corrupt politicians everywhere <laughs> who maybe once might do something right for a while.